As a flood expert, you came to a conclusion that there had been one worldwide flood. How did that happen? I saw plateaus. They occupy 40% of this planet. I saw underfit rivers all around the world, which are rivers that are in the wrong place. Sedimentary deposits. I saw fossils and so on. All of it points to a catastrophic global event. I came to the conclusion, as a non-Christian, as a scientist, that there was a global flood. Can you just tell us about the journey? Ron, you are a geomorphologist who says that the Earth's surface clearly shows that there's been a worldwide flood in the past. Mm. Now, we're going to unpack that and see what the evidence is. But first of all, what is a geomorphologist? Well, geomorphology is the study of Earth's landforms on the surface. And it actually involves the interaction of geologic data with atmospheric data with biologic data in how they came to be, their origin. Uh, I, however, am a specialist in fluvial geomorphology. I study rivers, floods, uh, floodplains, alluvial systems. So just to break the words down, geomorphologist. So geo mm. is earth, right? Correct. A morphology shape. Shape. And not only that, you're saying you're a fluvial geomorphologist. Correct. So fluvial water. So it's how water changes the shape of the earth. Am I interpreting that correct? Correct, Scott. Wow. So if anyone was to say that there's been a flood and the landforms of the Earth prove there's been a flood, it should be someone who's a fluvial geomorphologist, I reckon. I agree. <laughs> well, Ron, what are your, what's your level of qualification as a ge fluvial geomorphologist? Well, I did a PhD in fluvial geomorphology at the University of New England. Also uh, held positions in that university, as well as uh, undertaking research at uh, University of Sunshine Coast in Queensland, Griffith University in Queensland. Uh, but I did work worldwide. I taught for a number of years and research rather at Turku University in Finland and taught and researched uh, at the Chinese University in Hong Kong for many years as well. Okay, wow. So you've been a university professor at a number of universities across the world. You've got a PhD in this. Yes. And I, I guess you've released um, academic papers and wrote, wrote written books on the subject, maybe? Uh, yes. Uh, I'd say probably about 35 international peer-reviewed papers in top journals. Uh, but I've also published many other um, news clips, uh, magazine articles, those sorts of things. Um, Undertaken, I've written numerous book chapters, by the way, and also undertaken numerous consultancies around the world you know, for various governments and entities. So you're a well-qualified fluvial geomorphologist. I might just say flood expert. Would that, would that work? A well-qualified flood expert who says there's been a worldwide flood. But, Ron, um, I know, and other people may know, you're also a Christian. So the accusation could be put towards you that, Ron, mm. you're actually leaving your intellectual brain at the door. Yes, you're very well qualified. You're a very clever man. You know a lot about floods. You know a lot about geomorphology. But when you say there's been one worldwide flood, you're influenced by your Christian faith because we know that in the Bible, um, we have Noah's flood. We have a flood that floods the whole mm -hmm. earth and that's mm -hmm. simply a belief. And you've actually separated your knowledge and your thinking from your belief and you're being very influenced by your belief. So what would you say to that accusation? I've heard that accusation made a number of times, but it doesn't apply in my case. And that is because I was not a Christian at the time I came to accept that a global flood had occurred. That makes a bit of different sense. So it was before you were a Christian. So you were an atheist or an agnostic at the time you concluded there was a worldwide flood? I, I would say I was an agnostic at the uh, time I came to conclude that a worldwide flood had occurred. So that takes the bias out of the picture, I guess. So you were studying, you were studying the landforms of the world and you came to believe there was a worldwide flood? Correct. Can you talk us through that journey? Because surely that's not what you were taught originally. Am I correct? That's correct. I was not taught of a global flood. Um, but I did travel the world, as I've mentioned before. And so I came across many different landscapes that I studied. And they were also in, therefore, um, Arctic areas, tropical areas, arid areas, temperate areas. And I studied many different types of landforms, whether they be plateaus or water gaps or uh, uh, underfit rivers, as they're called. And what I saw in my world travels was a global picture that is somewhat different to what I had been taught and expected to see. I, I want to get into some of those specific evidences mm -hmm. um, that you mentioned, underfit rivers and, and various other things. But why do you think 
you've seen this? Because not many people, I, I mean, are there other geomorphologists that say there's been a worldwide flood? Very few. Very few. Okay, so why, why are there very few and what put you in the new, unique position to mm. allow you to come to this conclusion? Mm. I guess I was blessed in my university days in that I was educated to look for unusual pieces of data, things that didn't fit the picture. I was told that that's how science progresses, by searching for evidence that does not fit the current paradigm. That's not the way it is today, of course. The paradigm uh, rules supreme in most universities and in the way we think. But as I travelled the world, I did look for unusual pieces of data, unusual pieces of landform, and uh, began then to explore what's the significance of this. So partly it's because I was trained to look for abnormalities or differences or changes. Secondly, I did travel the world and was therefore giving an opportunity to explore them and to see a bigger picture than many scientists who are actually, or geomorphologists, who are actually involved in case-to-case -case studies within their local region. Yeah, okay, so first of all, you were thinking outside the box and you were taught to do that, which was pro probably not whatever, I mean, thanks to your teachers, your original teachers, they taught you that, but you're saying also, because you've traveled around, you've been to, um, you were talking mm. about your professorships in many different places, so you've probably studied a number of different landforms. So that's maybe unique as well, that sometimes people will only study one particular area. And I guess when you're making a conclusion of a worldwide flood, you need to look at a number of different areas. Um, so what, talk us through that journey, like what was the first thing that you saw that surprised you, that got you out of the normal paradigm? And, and what would the normal paradigm be? Would, would that be that there's been um, floods have occurred? Um, so I, as a flood expert, um, I've heard you call yourself a flood chaser. Would the normal paradigm be that there's been many floods in the past, but never a worldwide flood? How, and, yeah, can you, and then talk us through, how did you uh, break out of that normal paradigm? What was the pieces of evidence that made you think, hang on, I've got to reevaluate my uh, prior thought? Yes, I was taught that uh, landscapes came to be through multiple floods or multiple events. Uh, but as I travelled the world, what I saw uh, was a different picture, particularly with things like uh, plateaus or planation surfaces. The fact that sedimentary material rocks cover 70% of the planet, um, which are deposited mainly by floods, uh, indicated to me either there was a lot of floods that occurred or, or, or something different occurred. Uh, equally, uh, many landscapes... Um, were considered to be unusual in the early days. But when you travel the world, you see they are not unusual. They're actually quite common. And again, coming back to things like water gaps and those sorts of things and, and underfit rivers, they are very common. In other words, they're not abnormalities, they're normalities. And that started to, uh, I started to then think, well, I'm looking at a very different picture here. And so they all indicated catastrophic events even by geomorphologists looking at them on a case-to-case -case basis. But when you see them then occurring worldwide in such abundance, you begin to ask the question, is it multiple catastrophic events or is it a single catastrophic event? Interesting. So just to break that down at the start, you were saying 70% of the continents of the Earth are covered by sedimentary rock. And sedimentary rock's made up, of, made up by fast-flowing water, right? Basically, the majority of it would be, yes. Yeah. So, mm. so even like taking a basic kind of overview mm. of that, thinking, well, there's been big scale flooding. Um, but then you mentioned a number of other things like um, underfit rivers and water gaps. And you said it was because they were global in nature. Now, can you just describe to us what is, what's an underfit river? An underfit river in simple terms is uh, a river that looks out of place. In other words, it does not look large enough to have created the valley in which it sits. So it seems an inconsistency between the volume of water and the flood flows and the shape of the valley or the size of the valley. So underfit rivers come in many different shapes and sizes uh, and forms, but they clearly look as though they don't belong there. Right, so you've got a big wide valley and then you've got a small river and what you're saying is the river could have never carved that valley, is that right? Uh, correct. Uh, that's the, uh, the, the definition of an underfit river uh, is that it, the river itself does not explain the size of the valley. Okay, and could, 
could it be said that um, maybe it was a, a glacier that carved, like a previous glacier that carved that, and now there's a small river or something else carved mm. that? Is that possible? It's, it's a common question I hear yeah. that a glacier is responsible, but I think people mistake the idea that an ice age covered the entire Earth. Uh, it did not. It only covered uh, some of the northern and southern uh, hemisphere, uh, higher, higher latitudes. In fact, large parts of the planet, including most of Australia, and certainly much of Africa and uh, elsewhere, didn't suffer a ice age in the sense of glaciation. And so none of the valleys there were carved. Yet we would see underfit rivers all across central Australia, all along the East Coast, uh, all across the USA and other places where glaciers were never present. Yeah, interesting. So you're saying that um, because of the global extent of these features, that mm. was one of the reasons that got you thinking, hang on, it seems like there's this flood was a global flood because you're seeing these same features mm. across the globe. And one of them we was talking about underfit rivers. Um, we also mentioned water gaps. Uh, so m could you just, yeah, tell you, you mentioned water gaps. So could you mm. just tell us a bit about that? What's a water gap? Well, a water gap is when a river carves itself through a mountain range uh, with almost um, indifference. Uh, in other words, instead of flowing around a mountain range, it just carves a gorge through the mountain range itself. And particularly, say, in central Australia, uh, we have hundreds of them, where small channels, small tributaries, if you like, or small streams, seem to just cut through uh, a mountain range and leaving the most beautiful, beautiful landscapes that people love to tour and, and walk down these incredible gorges. But then when you look at the size of that flow and the size of that mountain, you wonder, well, how did that ever happen? So you're saying that the amount of flow from the river couldn't cut through the mountain. Uh, well, it couldn't cut through the mountain, therefore it was something, a bigger river in the past cut through it, and that river's just a small river that's found that path. The bigger river would have to be very big. Right. Okay, and you, that's that's what makes you say, okay, it's like a runoff from a worldwide flood. Uh, yes, because runoff from a worldwide flood is not uniform. It doesn't move off in a flow. In in in, uh, it would actually concentrate, and then begin to form gorges and uh, water gaps and all those sorts of features, yeah. as as water does anywhere when it flows off something. It creates gullies or rills and those sort of things we see today. If it's a much larger scale, it'll have much more of an impact. Yes. So so that's. Water gaps, underfit rivers, 70% of the continents covered with sedimentary rock. So these were some of the things you were starting to find. And I believe there was a, a number of other things as well. Uh, yes, for example, plateaus are common. 40% uh, of the planet is essentially sedimentary plateaus. And a plateau is essentially a elevated, relatively flat area. Now, 60% of Africa is a plateau. And so I began to ask the question, how do you find plateaus of el elevated areas with relatively uniform surfaces or slightly undulating surfaces that are meant to be hundreds of millions of years old. Surely they would have been torn apart at this stage. Yet to see it so prevalent as I flew around the world, you could be flying for an hour and still see the same plateau. And, and you'd ask, well, what happened over those hundreds of millions of years? So Ron, for those of us that are not um, earth scientists, uh, what what's the problem with a plateau? So just first of all, a plateau, if, if I got it mm. right, it's an elevated flat area of land. And and I, I guess I think of is, um, is Ayers Rock in the middle of Australia, is that a plateau? No, Ayers Rock is actually a tilted sedimentary layer. Oh, okay. If you look at the Great Dividing Range, yes. it is actually a plateau. Okay, so you're talking a big, much big, larger big thing. Scale. Now, yep. we can have small plateaus. We'd call yep. them different names, Mises and Buttes and those sorts of things. They're the remnants of a larger plateau. But we have plateaus still okay. uh, all around the planet. And they are elevated. They have been slightly eroded on top, but nowhere near the extent that one would expect yes. um, a, a, the erosion over, over that period of time. Okay, so because one comes to mind, Tibetan plateau is mm, that that's, one? that's yeah. another so example. Will be a large one, I guess. Mm. So what you're saying is the issue with them is that they are raised and that they're flat, and there should be erosion. There should be yes. Yep. So there should be gullies or divots or there should be continuous erosion over all of those millions of years. So I would expect to see a more undulating surface. Got you. And you said 40% of the continents are covered by plateaus. Correct. So mm. so that's that's a lot. We're talking about a lot of plateaus and they yes. and if the long ages are true, then we should see undulations, we should see erosion. Mm. Um, and what is that because of different weather systems occurring on the in the plateau? Like what if it was a uniform weather? Is that possible? Or? No, that's not possible. Yeah. Um, even in small 
plateau areas on the Great Dividing Range, even within a single catchment, we've monitored rainfall and erosion and so on. And depending upon where the rain falls on the day, it can have a significant impact or it could have no impact. So yes. it depends on the interaction, as I come back to geomorphology, it's the interaction of the of the actual geology with the atmosphere, with the biota as well. And so you get highly diverse reactions. But the fact is we, we don't see it on the plateaus. Yes. So all those millions of years of, of weather patterns migrating, changing, has had no, if that's what, if that's what occurred, have had minimal impact. Got you. So seeing the um, extent of these plateaus, learning the extent of them made you think, well, the normal explanation for the, or the, the millions of years don't fit with the plateaus. That's, that's what you're saying. But wh- how does the worldwide flood fit with the plateaus? Because that was the conclusion you came to. It, it's the plateaus are made of sedimentary rocks. In other words, they're torn up from other rocks. Now, to do that requires an erosional process, and erosion takes a lot of energy. Now, when you start looking at plateaus that may be up to 12 kilometres deep in sediment from the top to the bottom, and on average, they're about two kilometres worldwide, um, you've got to ask, well, that's a lot of sediment. Where did that come from? Why was it so beautifully packed? Why was it so such sedimentary beds so extensive, up to 10,000 square kilometres in the area? What river process could do that today? Right. So just to break it down, you're, um, you said two, up to two kilometres thick worth of sediment. That would sediment. be an average. An average. It'll, it'll go deeper to 12 kilometres easily, these plateaus, easily. Wow. And, and you're saying that there's, that has to be laid down by one event. I mean, how does sediment usually get laid down? What, what was your tradi- What's the normal belief or the, the secular belief of how sediment gets laid down? Well, the secular belief is that you would get small amounts of sediment laid down one on top of the other over a long period of time. By rivers or seas? By rivers, or, yeah. or it could be deltaic, it could be, um, yeah, yeah, along those lines, floodplains and so on. Yes. That's the argument, is yes. that it would be a very slow process over a long period of time. Got you. And, and so you're saying because there's such a thick layer, that indicates a flood, is that right? The thickness itself is a problem because that implies an incredible amount of erosion, which we don't see today. Mm by the way. But equally within those plateaus, you see sedimentary layers. You don't even see things like bioturbation where you've seen previous animal or um, organic material, root growth or so on. You just see simple sedimentary beds. I see you're talking the layer upon upon layer upon Upon layer. layer. Then you should see bioturbation, i.e. biota, living things, like worms and things, I guess, burrowing in between the layers. Yeah, if you look at a sediment today being deposited, say, on a floodplain, let's say you go out there after a rainstorm and you'll see new sediment deposited there. You go back a couple of days later, you will already see plant roots, you will see worms working actively and so on. Yes, so we should see that in the sedimentary record. You should see that between every layer, between every event. Yes. Now, in this case, when you look at these sedimentary strata, you don't see that. You just see the flat layers. You just layers. see the flat layers. So, um, so that ex- so a flood giving many different uh, f- uh, inundations would be an explanation for that. Well, what would you what you often see in a flood is you'll actually get many layers put down even in a single event. So to interpret, uh, uh, say, a plateau with all its layers, and you got all these layers there coming one on top of the other, to say that each was a different event. Well, that's not what we see in the world today. If you look at a floodplain being built or a delta, you could see multiple layers put down in one event. You don't have to interpret every layer as a single event. Right, okay. You can see multiple layers from one event. Yes, and I guess that was part of, um, that's part of the decision or part of the confusion between one worldwide flood and maybe many. Do they say there was many floods? Many that floods, made those many events, yes. hundreds uh, if not thousands. But you would then expect to see a sedimentary layer with some disturbance on the top from the from again coming back to geomorphology from the interactions of rainfall, the interactions of rainfall with biota, biological activity, all operating together. You would expect to see evidence of that. But when you don't see that, all you see is one layer on top of another layer on top of another layer with absolute wonderful uniformity in its in its layering without disturbance. You'd have I, I'd I'd ask the question. Well, those those layers must have been placed down day after day after day after day by events almost on a daily basis to prevent uh, bioturbation and those sort of features. Yes, and, and that might sound like the global flood that had 150 days of water rising. Um, there probably would have been uh, 
layer upon layer being laid down in that kind of large event over a period of time. Uh, absolutely, because it it it, uh, it it's just a simply larger scale to what we see today in a floodplain or a delta. We just see layer after layer being put down, uh, one on top of the other, and uh, the flood, the global flood would have had the same effect, but on a larger scale. And that's what we see in the sedimentary rocks. We see them on a larger scale. Yeah, so this is interesting because you have studied floods in real time, have you? Yes. Yeah, so that, that must be... A... It's, got, it's exciting. <laughs> I was just going to say, it must be a little bit dangerous. <laughs> it, it, it can be. You can be washed away and knocked unconscious, as I've been, and you can be rescued by SES, as I have been. It was good fun. <laughs> but putting yourself in harm's way for the, for the sake of the science, I guess. You could put it that way. <laughs> so, so what, but what you're saying is you have seen, as you've studied floods in real time, you've seen a layer upon layer being laid down with no bioturbation because there's no time for any little critters to mm. go up and down. Um, and you've seen that type of layering. But what you're saying is on a worldwide scale or when you look at, you can see that in a much larger scale. Correct. When you look at rock faces or drill cores or things like this. Correct. And you've been telling us about the things that you were seeing. Now, can you just tell us a bit about the journey? Like, what was the first thing that you saw that made you think, hang on, that kind of points to a worldwide flood and what was your mindset like at the time? The first part of my journey wasn't so much that there was a worldwide flood, it was why there were inconsistencies from what I saw to what I was taught. So even in Finland, I was taught that there were multiple ice ages, but I couldn't see the evidence of that. I saw the evidence of one ice age. Um, when I was uh, in the Amazon, I was seeing sedimentary strata, 12 kilometres deep. All sorts of evidence was coming to me. So at the very early stages of my journey, I began to question the existing paradigm. And I would do that in a friendly manner with colleagues. We'd sit together and have coffee or something like that. And I'd raise issues and uh, challenges. And we'd get into some productive discussions, but at each time I was warned uh, not to go too far with a, a biblical interpretation, which is not what I was seeking. I was seeking a scientific interpretation, not a biblical one, but they were interpreting my comments as having a biblical basis. Okay, so you weren't actually saying, hey, colleagues, I think there's a worldwide flood. You were saying, what about these planation surfaces? What about these sedimentary layers? Correct. And, and did, did some of them say, well, it looks like a large-scale flood, Ron? No, that was not a common comment. Uh, yeah. it's, it's, uh, it's, that's not expressed often. I did start to move towards a global flood once multiple lines of evidence had come together. Now, we've, we've talked about um, um, underfed rivers, we've talked, you know, uh, gorges, plateaus, and so on. When you start to put that together, you start to get a commonality there, and you start to see that the commonality is something of a catastrophic nature. The other element was that it was fluvial because they were sediments and they were sedimentary rocks that were carved. So we're looking now, I began to ponder something of a catastrophic nature and something of a flood catastrophe must have occurred. So I began to raise this more frequently in, in various countries. I've done it for quite some time, in fact. It was over a 30-year period. Oh, so it was uh, over 30 years. 30-year 30 period. Until you came to the conclusion. Until I came to the conclusion. Correct. And it was through many discussions with other people uh, as well. And at times they were friendly discussions. At times I was a bit laughed at, but that was all good. Well, I was enjoying it as I explored a new idea. But ultimately, I came to the conclusion from multiple lines of evidence in so many different environments, whatever the landscape is, whatever the tropical or temperate or Arctic environment, you were seeing the same pattern that indicated catastrophic fluvial event, catastrophic flood event. And, and one, it pointed to one. It catastrophic. pointed to one, mm. absolutely. It pointed to one. And so you had this 30-year journey of concluding that there was a worldwide flood. Mm. Um, can you tell us what was the moment that you, was there a moment when you accepted, you said, okay, this I've had enough talks with colleagues, I've seen enough evidence worldwide, um, I, I accept this as the truth, there was one worldwide flood. And... How did that impact your thoughts towards the Bible? Good question, Scott. It, there was a moment. Um, I finally accepted that the global flood did occur. It actually matched the Bible, and I had 
been exposed to the Bible at numerous points in my journey as a non-Christian. And I saw the two line up and I thought the physical evidence, the biological evidence, the landscape evidence point to a global flood. The Bible says that a global flood did occur. And I went one day, okay, then that's that's my conclusion that a global flood did occur. It, I was satisfied both, well, I was satisfied as a scientist, I was satisfied as a historian almost, because I accepted the Bible as a, uh, a document of history. Interesting. So you hadn't accepted Christ at this point, but no. you, but the flood helped, or realising, looking at the physical evidence in the world, helped you realise or helped you have faith in the Bible's history. Mm. Mm. So I began to express that in an open environment, in, an o in a university environment, with my comments that I believe a God does exist. Mm. Um, because I saw science matching with biblical history. Gosh. And that led to some interesting reactions from university staff and students as well. So you're quite bold in, in saying this. I wasn't so much bold. To me, it was, again, still a scientific outcome. And I was making those comments as a scientist that God exists. I had not accepted Christ, but I accepted that there is a God and that the biblical history was correct. Interesting. And so you um, you came to Christ as a result of this? Because uh, choosing to lay down your life for Jesus, I guess, is another thing than understanding that God's real. No, I was quite resistant, actually. <laughs> quite resistant. And why was that? Well, you, you need to put yourself in a situation of being in a university as a professor, and you're also director of a research institute, that the moment you proclaim yourself as a Christian or you go down that track, you know that particularly within science faculties worldwide, there's going to be some problems. There's going to be some strong arguments against you. Uh, the fact that I was even expressing that a God might exist as an agnostic would lead to notes on my door, which is rather interesting. You get a scientist quite willing to put their name on a paper to be published, but they won't put their name on a note on your door oh. uh, when they criticise you for making these public comments. It's, it's quite interesting. Uh, but the point being, why would I give up a career as a professor, research money, I, I established research stations, research institutes. My life was just well, I was well looked after, let's put it that way, yeah. from a monetary point of view, from a prestige point of view. So I put up a lot of resistance uh, to giving my life to Christ. Am I right in thinking that there, there would be other Christians that were university professors? So what was the issue with you giving your life to Christ? Interesting point there. Uh, some of the academics whom I knew were Christians, they were all overseas. I didn't find many in Australia. Uh, so when I was overseas, I was in countries where faith was far more prevalent and visible in universities. Uh, even the Chinese university in Hong Kong, faith was very strong. Yeah, okay, so it's just a no-no in the Western world. But in countries. the Western world, it's an, it was more of a, uh, you know you're going to jeopardise your career. Mm -hmm. if you make that statement. But I, I, I guess it's because you're not, um, you wouldn't just be accepting it as an ethereal thing, as an addition to your lifestyle, being a Christian as well. You, you're accepting the whole story because you had mm. accepted the history of it. Mm. And I think that's probably, I would guess that's where the issue lies more. Yeah, because it would affect my teaching. Yep. It would affect my research. Yes. And therefore, it would affect my grant applications. It would, have, it would affect my... Uh, authority in research institutions, other academics wouldn't necessarily listen to what I'm saying. So, but you went ahead and you did make that decision anyway, and how did that work out? What happened is I was challenged by an atheist at the university, an atheist who was quite concerned that, um, uh, who, who was aware that there were uh, really no Christian tutors, Christian lecturers, Christian senior lecturers. This atheist demanded to know to prove that God did not exist. And uh, interestingly, challenged to want to go to church to prove that God did not exist. And so this uh, biologist lady said, we'll, we'll go to church and I'll prove to you God does not exist. And I thought, well, no harm doing that. And uh, I put it off for a long, long time. I was resisting. But ultimately, we both went to a local church. And uh, on that day, we both gave our lives to Christ. 
the atheist and the agnostic. Wow. Without so, any Christian support. <laughs> so you're supposed to prove that God doesn't exist. And in, in the church, what happened? We don't recall the sermon at all, neither of us. We just knew we were hit uh, essentially by the Holy Spirit. And uh, we both uh, that day gave our lives to Christ. Um, and um, yes, we just on that day declared we were Christians. Wow. So that changed everything. Um, that lady and I were having a little bit of trouble communicating beforehand. Afterwards, uh, we didn't have that problem anymore, so I married her. <laughs> wow, this sounds like a whole other story there, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> so in the end, you became a Christian, but it was you actually accepted the Bible's history first because of the evidence that you saw um, in the geomorphology of the earth. Um, now, we were talking about some of those evidences, and there's one that I know you've talked to me about before, but we haven't mentioned so far, and that is to do with the sediment supply and the amount of sediment that's um, needed to mm. bur bury fossils. So we were talking, you did, we did mention that you would see these, you'd study these local scale floods, and you would mm. see the amount of sediment there, and then you would see these huge amounts of sediments and say, oh, well, I think that's from a, a global flood. So can you talk us through what is the issue with sediment supply and mm -hmm. the and fossils. Mm -hmm. A good question, Scott. Uh, sediment supply today um, is incredibly minute. I think one of the problems we have is to assume that there's a lot of sediment on the move, uh, but there's not. You know, for example, even in the ocean floors, uh, our studies over about seventy years of monitoring the sediment on the ocean floors reveals we'd uh, we'd estimate uh, fifty millimeters over a thousand years. Now. I struggled with that because if that's all we're getting on the ocean floor, yet over 95% of all fossils are marine, uh, how would 50 millimetres over a thousand years explain that? But the sediment supply rate all around the world is low. If you look at um, continental shelves uh, near the, near the uh, coastline, you'd get estimates of about, uh, and this is from hundreds of studies, you'd get estimates of about 300 millimetres in a thousand years. Wow. I mean, when you try and even imagine what that is, it's almost nothing. If you then even come onto floodplains, you'll get uh, readings of maybe three centimetres or in an event or one that I record was a 10 centimetre uh, deposit in one event. It's still extremely small. And then even when uh, I'd raise this as, as I was travelling the world with colleagues, and they said, well, you need to even look at maybe tsunamis and other catastrophic events. Mm. But a tsunami equally has minimal effect on sediment transport. You might be looking at deposits of, say, 10 centimetres again. Now, all of that raised problems in my mind with fossils, because on the one hand, we seem to have minimal sediment on the move, Yet our stratigraphic record, our sedimentary record, shows trillions of fossils were created. Now, to create a fossil, not only do you need a lot of sediment, you need it travelling pretty fast. You need a lot of sediment. Rapid burial is what you need. Today, I would argue, I'd be surprised if anything is being fossilised today at all mm. because uh, we just do not have the amount of sediment in any environment anywhere around the world. Mm. I mean, I guess you get the very rare cases of like, you're talking in the open floodplains, right? Because you get the very rare case of a, a cave being filled in with mineralized yes, water yes. or it's someone falling in a tar pit or something like that. You, you will get small yeah. examples like that. But, but, but when you're talking about regional areas, yeah. it's it's almost... Well, 10 centimeters uh, is, is surely not enough if you've got to bury, I mean, a fish. How, how, much, how much sediment do you need to bury a fish and make it fossilized, Ron? Uh, Interesting question, and there's research going on about that now in Japan. Yeah. Um, but is the, it more than 10 centimetres? Oh, absolutely more than 10 centimetres. Right, okay, okay. You would need much more. Yeah. In fact, experiments have been done in laboratories trying to mimic fossilisation. Mm. And uh, I've written an article on uh, baby crocodiles being buried in 20 centimetres of sediment, uh, but one of them, of course, bloated and broke out of the 20 centimetres. So in other words, 20 centimetres was not enough, and that far exceeds what we've measured around the world today. Um, in, in fact, 20 centimetres wouldn't, you, you wouldn't, you, you cannot achieve fossilisation. You need a lot of pressure. Yes. There's a reason for that, is that if you place pressure on an organism, it forces the liquids out of the body, out of the organism, and that allows fossilisation. If you don't remove the liquids, you actually can't fossilise. 
So in other words, the depth of the sediment has to be quite significant to create the pressure, the liquid's then absorbed by the sediment right. and allows the fossilization to continue. Yeah, I'm thinking and that's been tested in experiments. You need a lot of pressure. Yeah, I was just about to ask. I think people might be asking, well, how do you know that? But I think you've reviewed a paper where they were uh, making fossils, fossil lizards, was it? Correct. What they were doing was placing fossil parts between two pieces of concrete and for almost 20 years, putting a lot of pressure on it, but not being able to create a fossil. One day they decided to put that lizard part or a leaf, for example, wrap it up in sediment. In, in, into like a flood type sediment, then place the pressure on it, and 24 hours later, they had mimicked fossil creation. Wow, under, so you're saying under, in 24 hours, yes. once when they included sediment. Yes, because then the it sediment worked. absorbed the liquid and allowed the fossilization to occur. In other words, how deep is the sediment required? We don't know, but we do know it's got to be tens, if not hundreds of meters deep. For the pressure and the temperature. For the, the temperature pressure and the temperatures to be, be changed. Yeah, and yep. I, I guess the other thing you need to look out for there is predators. If, as you say, if, if it's, it's only a few centimeters of sediment and then it bloats and it floats, the, Correct. the crocodile Correct, you'll, you'll have predators, you'll also have um, decomposition, decay, all those sorts of features. So, so let's just review that. What you're saying is the largest tsunamis in the world, so um, what about the 2011 Fukushima tsunami in Japan or the 2004 tsunami Southeast mm. Asia, mm. you're saying they were no more than 10 centimetres sediment? A lot of the studies show that um, the sediment the sediment is not actually moved yeah. much in a tsunami at all. That's our perception. That's our interpretation. What actually, when, you, when you look at a tsunami, or often called a tidal wave, it's not a physical wave. It's actually an energy wave coming onto shore. It only transforms into a physical wave as the near shore shallows. That's why boats go out to sea. There's no wave out there. And so what happens is only in that final stages, as it forms into a wave, will it actually then begin to churn up and move sediment. So if you look at many of the photographs, for example, from Indonesia, what you're going to find is yes, all the houses were destroyed, all the roads were destroyed, but the trees are still standing and the grass is still standing. And fascinatingly, the grass will be covered in a thin layer of sediment which the next rainfall will wash off. So in terms of the actual sediment movement in the tsunami, it's minimal. Okay, so, so the tsunamis we see today and we've recorded are on the scale, like we're saying 10 centimetres is about the maximum. Oh, I'm sure there's variations, but, but, but roughly. You, only, you only look, these, these are minus. When you look at, compare that to the global picture of sediments, mm. It's insignificant. It's, yeah. it's just, so you're and saying, certainly 10 centimetres does not create a fossil. So an event must have happened in the past. If we'd have these thick sediment layers with, with fossils in them, there's no way that could happen unless there was a much bigger event that we've never experienced on the earth before. Correct. And so again, yeah, that's pointing to a big flood. Correct. You also saw in those, in those experiments that said that fossils could form rapidly, even in 24 hours, you were saying one of those experiments. That's a laboratory experiment. A laboratory experiment. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, cool. So so w this was part of, how did that, that was part of your journey as well into just thinking about worldwide flood? Because as a fluvial geomorphologist, you probably didn't look at fossils as much, but you w were aware of them. Mm. Uh, correct, but I was traveling with biologists often and uh, other scientists as well in my journeys around the world. And so I would listen to the stories of fossils and uh, it, it was a problem that paleontologists have, is how do you explain fossils given the very limited range of sediment? Yes. And to me, that became the fine point. Without lots of sediment, you can't create a fossil. But nowhere on the planet today does it indicate we're getting lots of sediment. Now, the media will tell you otherwise, but when you look at the scientific data, you're only talking about, over large scales, centimetres. And even centimetres then can completely change a landscape, as in if you had 10 centimetres in a mangrove, you, you'd probably take out the mangroves. That doesn't happen. So what I'm getting out there is that the amount of sedimentation on, on the planet today is minuscule. Right, so you're a flood expert, a flood chaser. You've seen floods in real time. You've seen the amount of sediment that um, can accumulate. And that's no way near the scale that we see in the sedimentary layers in the rocks. It's no way near the scale needed for fossils to occur. This was part of your journey coming to believe in a one worldwide flood, a 30 year journey. I wanna ask you the question, why, why do other people not see this? It seems so obvious um, when, you, when you take us through the evidence. Why do people not see this today? 
Well, I think they struggle in, in the same way I struggled, is that um, we are taught a certain belief system, a certain paradigm of long age, of slow sedimentation. And when you do a case-by-case -case study research in a locality, and that's where you stay, I think you can see why they remain in that, in that belief system. I think in my case, uh, traveling around the world and then also not looking at just one type of landform, but looking at many types of landform, then also meeting and interacting with paleontologists and biologists and so on and seeing they face the same problems that I faced yes. in that the evidence globally was not uh, matching what we were taught as a process. And I say that because, surprisingly, a number of my non-Christian friends who travel with me around the world say they see the same evidence that I saw and they see that there's a possible interpretation but as non-Christians, they're not going to accept it at this stage. But it's interesting they accept my interpretation mm. that a global flood did occur. It's a journey we all have to go on, and a lot of people don't have the opportunity to see what I've seen, mm. meet whom I've met, um, explore where I've explored. Yeah, you had that wider view. And you also explained to me that as in the middle of that 30-year journey, uh, satellite imagery was becoming more available. And, and you had a unique opportunity to look at that and see that that showed large-scale features on the Earth as well. Could you tell us a bit about that? Uh, correct, yes. When, when uh, Landsat images and SLAR images and others became available, it did change the way we thought. Um, and it was an interesting journey because uh, you couldn't even get those images necessarily on computer in the early days. You got them as, as uh, print copies of um, and Landsat images of parts of the planet. And uh, particularly when I was in Finland, we actually purchased, or well, that team purchased all the images for the Amazon, uh, where you could uh, look at the Amazon uh, on hard copy Landsat images. You get a very different view, a mm. very different view, uh, because why? You can see landscapes you couldn't see before. You could see scales you could never see before. And so that helped us then to help me particularly to match um, landscape to landscape, region to region, feature to feature, and so on. So the moment we started to get access to those sort of images, it was, it was wonderful. So you were yeah. describing to me, you saw something that really surprised you when you first looked at um, mm. some of these Landsat images. And it was instead of the river basin draining in, you saw what looked like to be a huge delta. Um, but you could only, but because it, it was covered by the Amazon rainforest, you couldn't, you're telling me you couldn't even see it via um, aerial photography. It had to be the satellite photography. Can you tell Correct. us about it? Correct. It, it was an interesting uh, experience I had. All, all, all we had was lots of images. So one day I asked if I could have the hall at the university, and this was in Finland. I laid all the images out on the floor of the hall and then climbed up a ladder and went up to the top. And uh, at that point I looked down as no one had done before. And I saw that the drainage system was not a normal one, it was a reverse drainage system. And um, I said, this is exactly the opposite of what one would expect over a large area, it was 10,000 square kilometers. And quite simply then, uh, the team contacted a friend who was in the Amazon at the time, get some samples, and it turned out to be a volcanic fan, massive volcanic fan. It's called volcan volcanoclastic material uh, and a fan. So these images changed the way we could see much of the landscape, gave us insights. Even with the underfit rivers, we thought they were rare. But once you saw them, you started to realise that 50% of all the rivers in France immediately showed that they were underfit. They were not the abnormal, they were the normal. And so Landsat images, SLAR images, all sorts of images changed the way we looked at things. Yes, you're seeing these big, these big features that we didn't know you had such huge features until we could see the satellite images. Correct. And, Correct. and, and you were looking, it reminds me of the story of um, Harlan Bretz, who uh, looked at the Channel mm. Scablands in, uh, in Washington state. And it was in the 1920s. And he said, look, I think there's been a huge flood here. No, not a worldwide flood. He said, I think there's been a huge flood, a glacial mm. flood. And everyone disagreed with him. But it wasn't and it wasn't until the 70s when they started looking at the satellite imagery that they said, oh, look, he's mm. been right for 40 mm. years and we've all been wrong. Mm. And I, I've even read a, a record of one geologist visiting the area in the 60s. And he was one of his vehement opposers um, who would say, say things to him uh, like he was, it was preposterous what he was saying, or that he was incompetent. But when he visited the site and looked at the gorges, he said, "How could have I been so wrong?" Uh, so I, I wonder, 
I wonder if we'll we'll get the same with a worldwide flood that we'll start to have more people. Okay, maybe they won't become Christian, but they'll start to recognize that there's been a worldwide flood. Do you think that's a possibility? Good question, Scott. I think <laughs> <laughs> paradigm is very strongly embedded in society, yeah. very strongly. It's a faith. Yes. It's yes. a faith. It's yeah. not a scientific belief. Yes. It's a faith. They will argue it's not a faith, but it is. Thanks a lot for your time here. Um, My pleasure. We've explored a, your journey into discovering there was a worldwide flood as a professional geomorphologist. Now, why can Christians um, maybe haven't got the professional background as you, how can they be sure that there was a worldwide flood? Well, they won't get it from current universities, let's put it that way. Um, and I would say simply, you, you actually have to go to Creation Ministries International to the website. There you will see dozens, if not more, scientists from all around the world arguing from their own experiences that a global flood did occur. And I would encourage Christians to be using the Creation Ministries website because that's where you'll find the majority of data that points to it. And it's accurate data, it's scientific data, it's not a Christian belief. Necessarily. It's, it's, as you heard in my case, it's actual scientific data. And that's the, what I find as I travel around Australia and overseas, I find uh, that site opens up many minds, uh, many hearts as well, from people who say thank you, because we don't hear that in the media, we don't hear that uh, in uh, radio or, or uh, television, we don't hear that in the newspapers. We don't we don't read it in books. We don't see it on television or in movies. Uh, we just don't see it, especially in universities. It's not even taught today in primary schools or secondary schools, and so they are actually not exposed to that idea. And then, uh, and you've you've written a number of articles mm. on creation.com and for the magazine. And I've heard you say that it was actually more difficult for you to write those articles than some of the um, scientific <laughs> papers that you've written in the past. What, why is that? <laughs> That's correct, Scott. It was very difficult to write for Creation Ministries because they insist on the on the absolute highest of standards. I've published in top international journals, but when I first when I submitted my first paper to Creation Ministries, they said, do you realise that people have to understand what you're saying? You're not writing to a scientist, Ron, you're writing to the public. And so my first paper, uh, my, uh, you know, I, I'd submit other papers elsewhere and they'd be accepted immediately. My first paper to Creation Ministries International had to be rewritten four times until it met the standards that CMI, Creation Ministries International, has set up. Also, it had to be uh, theologically and scripturally absolutely correct. Did I enjoy that process? Not on day one, but since then I've loved it because I've learned to write differently, uh, to be able to communicate better to people and to be more scripturally correct. And I find that's the beauty of Creation Ministries papers. Uh, there's a lot of effort, a lot of work, and you've got to applaud those who are actually involved in the editing process. Great. So you're saying I don't have to be an internationally renowned fluvial geomorphologist to understand the articles? Correct, correct. They are written for uh, upper high school and adults. And so, and, I, and, and they're written for non-scientists. That's the most important point. Great. And we get constant letters, and I get personal letters from churches I've visited saying, thank you. I read the paper you recommended. It was amazing. It opened up so many ideas. Okay, thanks a lot, Ron. That's, that's great. So if viewers want to find out more, want to uh, find out more of some of the things you've been talking about, be convinced themselves that there's a worldwide flood, use creation.com, use the search bar, mm. type in your question. Um, I've heard you say don't type flood in there because you'll get hundreds of articles, <laughs> but type how did the flood happen, when did it happen, yes. how many animals are on there, are, all those questions are answerable there. So thanks a lot for your time, Ron, today. It's been really interesting to learn about your journey and um, how you became convinced that there was a worldwide flood. Thank you, Scott.